We've now got uh, 100 people joined us. So I think what we'll do is we'll do a welcome while other people are joining. We'll leave the poll up for all of you to uh, contribute to as you log in, please. So I'm going to give you a very warm welcome to World Whistleblowers Day, a chance for us all to celebrate the great work that whistleblowers around the world do to speak up um, and stop harm in the public interest. And this year, we're really delighted to be partnering with the Whistleblowing International Network, and I'll hand over to Anna shortly, and to have an international panel of experts to talk about the thorny issue of rewards. Um, so we wanted to hold a discussion today, not a debate, because this is a very uh, emotive subject with very strong opinions. Um, and we've invited our esteemed ex researchers on all matters whistleblowing from a uh, professor of economics from Italy and a professor of business ethics from France to tell us what does the evidence on rewards actually say? And for those of you who don't know very much about rewards in the US, there are a whole number of, and I'll do this very briefly, a whole number of whistleblower reward schemes at individual and uh, federal and state level where whistleblowers providing tips that aid enforcement can receive um, a proportion of the enforcement fine um, as a reward. So if they present valuable information to the um, regulator that leads to an enforcement fine, often of a certain value over a million dollars, for example, then they may receive up to 30% of that fine as a reward. Now, interestingly, across the 27 member states of the EU, we've just had a whole swathe of new whistleblowing laws introduced as a result of the EU directive, and they've chosen not to go down that route. So why is that? What's the difference? And why? Um, what can we learn in the UK? Um, because in the UK, rewards have largely been absent. We have a slightly opaque system of discretionary awards, both by the HMRC and by the Competition and Markets Authority. They will issue rewards. Um, and indeed, in the last month, the Competition and Markets Authority increased the amount it would give a whistleblower who gave them information on cartels from £100,000 to £250,000. But we don't know why. Is that because it was really working really well or because it wasn't working yet? Um, so uh, it's a really good time for us in the UK to explore what can rewards tell us? Um, we've got an emphasis on tackling economic crime with two economic crime bills going through Parliament. And as London is accused of being the dirty money capital of Europe, perhaps it's time to look again at whether rewards work. Protect's view has always been that for the most of our whistleblowers, and we hear from two and a half to three thousand people a year, rewards are largely irrelevant. Uh, they might, for the vast number of court people who call us from health and education, care homes, local government, it's, it's not a debate that matters to them. And there's little appetite for rewards so far in the UK. But we're interested today in hearing about the evidence. And if we're serious about improving our record on economic crime, perhaps we need to look at what really works. So I'm going to say thank you very much for those of you who've submitted questions. I hope everybody can see the poll. Uh, can, can I just have some, uh, if everybody can see the poll, we've at the moment, we're running at 25% yeses in terms of should the UK adopt whistleblowing reward systems. About 33%, a third of you say no, and four in 10 of you are not sure. So we'll, what we'll do is we'll run that poll again at the end of the session and see whether or not people have changed their minds. So um, I'm gonna hand over now to the uh, executive director of the Whistleblowing International Network, um, Anna Myers. Uh, and Protect is a proud founder member of the network um, and invite her to chair a discussion between Professor Spaniolo and Professor van der Kerkova um, about rewards. Um, and I would say at the beginning that uh, the views expressed are the panelists' own. If anybody would like to ask a question as we go along, could you please put it in the Q&A box that you'll see at the bottom of your screen and we'll try and answer as many questions as we go. Okay, with that, I will hand over to Anna and we'll end the poll for now um, and we'll come back to that later. Over Good to you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you very much, Liz. I am really delighted to um, be able to have this discussion today because I think this is an issue that's been 
in and out of news, uh, certainly in the whistleblower protection community around the world, um, there are strong views about uh, what should happen and how we should better compensate whistleblowers and protect them. On World Whistleblower Day, this is really important for us. Um, as WIN, which we, we are an, an, an international a global network, um, and we bring together civil society organizations from around the world. Uh, we work together to share expertise, uh, to empower one another, to mobilize around key issues and educate the, the public on whistleblowers and on whistleblowing issues. And I think it's really important that we continue to learn, that we continue to challenge our own narratives and to have these important discussions on areas that can still remain slightly uh, opaque for us. So I, I am really delighted to have Giancarlo Spagnola, who is um, Spagnolo, sorry, who is professor of economics, who is very, um, uh, you know, has worked so long in the field of economics. He has incredible um, background in research and as being uh, both a research and public um, publisher of very good, strong uh, research that he's done. And he's been a key speaker around the world on these issues. And he has a, a strong interest in this particular field. And as well with Bim van der Kerkova, with Professor of Business Ethics, who I've had a pleasure of knowing for many years, who's looked at this from a, a normative attitudes and response to whistleblowers, how these norms are reflected in procedures and regulations. He is also internationally recognized researcher and collaborates with a range of, of actors. So here we have two people who've looked at this issue, have, have uh, some research on it, and I'd really like to give you each a few moments to uh, talk about your research, talk about your knowledge. If we could start with you, Giancarlo, and then we'll move to, to, to Wim, and then we'll have uh, some question and answers and hopefully from the audience as well. So thank you very much and over to you, Giancarlo. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. So thank you for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here, trying to give you some numbers to think about on this uh, on this uh, topic. I've been, uh, I will only talk about numbers in published papers on peer review independent academic research. No report commissioned by industry or things like that. Okay, so my task is to give you know give an overview of what recent research tell us about the effectiveness of, of the effects of rewards for whistleblowers. Most of the research is based on U.S. data because the other countries don't collect data as well. And if you want good research, you need good data. So point one. Uh, there is a, a overwhelming evidence that this tool is an amazing, amazing efficient tool of law enforcement. It has an enormous power in discovering fraudsters of any kind. I mean, the recoveries are enormous. It produces a lot of valuable information, very comparably very little problems of uh, you know, fake claims or things like that that people were expecting. We don't see this in data and research. Um, healthcare has been uh, uh, the most important part, but because of the success in healthcare, the US can uh, expand the, these rewards. Financial sector, uh, well, it's very important because in financial sectors, of course, you know, drug cartels or Russian mobsters use very sophisticated means of transferring money. And the only way, you know, police force are not able to track these guys, the only way to find information is to whistleblowers. So most importantly, the research has found a large general deterrence effect. This is a very, a very difficult thing to find in law enforcement. It's very difficult to identify the effect of a law in terms of preventing future crime. Well, the research has shown that uh, these visible rewards reduce a lot the amount of insider trading, um, corruption, uh, and its effect on investments. Um, tax evasion through offshore banks, uh, tax evasion in general, financial misreporting, and uh, and healthcare fraud. Okay, there is no evidence of false claims being a problem. Um, people were very scared about that. I don't know why, because obviously a normal whistleblower who is right and has serious information has already a terrible life after it blows the whistle. It's only a crazy kamikaze would go with false information against a company and their long persons. But some people said this could be a problem. Well, it's not in the data, no problem uh, of false um, claims. There is no evidence that their minds internal whistleblowers. 
So 90% of whistleblowers that applied for awards, either in the uh, False Claim Act or at the CSC, they first contacted their own supervisors in the firm, 90%, and only after they were either fired or dismissed as a claim, they decided to go outside. So it's not true that this undermines internal whistleblowers. So that's what the data is saying, I'm just saying that from the data, maybe in the future we'll find something else. Then uh, uh, protection is found to be very insufficient, even in the US where they're probably the most efficient protection system. You still have complaints from whistleblowers, at least 30% of them get very strong retaliation. And you know, since these rewards arrived after five years, this is a very bad uh, life for these people for these five years. Uh, there is um, um, evidence the internal compliance system do not work. This evidence goes back to the Salman Oxley Act. There was an act in 2002, and we saw that internal whistleblowers, uh, internal compliance systems in companies, in financial companies, do not work. Or they actually had this high, high crime, and uh, this led to the, the reason why the Dodd Frank Act reacted by enacting this uh, reward is because internet compliance system did not work as we saw with the financial crisis. Uh, there is no uh, evidence of crowding out honest behavior. There are a couple of papers that show that there is a little uh, crowding out of honest behavior from very small uh, tips. Like there is a paper showing that uh, if you report your colleague for not showing up at work and you get uh, a, a reward like half of your a month of wage, then you don't do it. But of course, you know, you have to live with this colleague for the next 20 years. You won't, you, know, you don't want to have an enemy next to you. So this is not something apply, applicable to what we're talking about. I'm not talking about a, a small guy reporting a CEO with powerful attorney and so on. So this evidence that is present has no uh, significance for the problem we are discussing. Finally, um, yeah, no, that's actually what's the last one. Uh, how much time do I have? Well, you can certainly take a, another couple of minutes and then I'll go to okay. Wim and then we so, can come back and have okay. a discussion. So this is what I wanted to say in general. I just wanted to talk about one paper, which is just published by a guy from MIT. He focused on healthcare uh, fraud, fraud on Medicare, which is uh, healthcare for the elderly and the disabled and, and so on. So he find it, he studies very very sophisticated um, methodology for case studies. He shows that for about 1.9 billion in whistleblower rewards, they were able in these four case studies to recover for the first five years 19 billions of fraud that didn't happen because of whistleblowers. So they saved 17 billions only in terms of that case. So this doesn't take into account all the general deterrence effect is when in the newspaper you say, okay, this company you know, has been uh, reported, it's been caught, this should have an effect in terms of preven preventing and deterring future issues. So, and uh, the cost, the administrative cost that the agencies also care about, were about 108 million. The recovery were 17 billion. So the rate uh, is that for $1, invested in whistleblower reward schemes against health uh, fraud, you get $170 back into fraud money coming back into the system and helping, you know, the health care system care, take care of kids and so on and so forth. This is only about the cases that you catch without taking into account general deterrence. So the order of magnitude of the, the effectiveness of of this, it's unprecedented in the history of law enforcement. Uh, uh, and that's uh, last but not least, uh, uh, the agencies in the US were against these uh, programs. They didn't want the, the reform of the False Claim Act. It was pushed on the agency, on the DOJ, by the parliament, UK Congress. And the uh, SEC did not want uh, the, the Dodd Frank. Now they are happy. Like, hell, if you look at what they say, they say this is the best instrument we have ever had. Um, also, because the percentage of this uh, recovered goes to fund these agencies. So, yes, they have a little more work, 
but then they can afford hiring more people. And this is completely missing in the debate in Europe, and so the agencies in Europe are scared that they have to work like hell with this new instrument, and that could be one story why nobody wants this instrument. But I don't, even in the US, the agency were against. It was the parliament that puts this. Uh, okay. And then I'm finished here. Thank you very much. Great. No, thank you very much, Giancarlo. And that gives us a really good picture of the data. Um, that you've studied and uh, and researched and pulled out and the other papers that you know about, or other research you know about, that's terrific. I do have a couple of questions that I want to sort of pull out a bit, but I will move first to Wim. Um, and uh, and please, if you could give us uh, sort of what the issues are the, as you see them in the compensation and rewards. Thank you, Anna, and thank, thank you for inviting me to, to kick off today's discussion in, in this webinar. Uh, I think you know in in the title of the webinar, there's there's this this notion U.S. style rewards, so that actually means uh, whistleblowers gets percentage of collected money, and that's one particular model, and it's important that's one particular model of perhaps a more general notion, uh, give money to people who fight the good fight, and I think if that were the motion where where we'd be discussing, I think you know we'd have a short discussion because we could all agree on that. Right, give money to people who fight the good fight. Yes, please, let's let's do that. But we're not discussing that. What, what we're discussing is uh, basically is percentage of recovered assets the best model. Now it's it's whistleblowers' day, and here's where it gets peculiar for me because if it were regulators' day, then we could answer that question with yes, and we can proceed with a technical discussion uh, around certain parameters for efficiency. But because the, I think you know the, this model, it's it's regulators' logic, um, and so I believe, and this is the point I try to make, it's a little bit of uh, a smoke and mirrors to equate what is logical from a regulator's point of view to what is from a whistleblower's point of view. And what I mean is, if you look at the the, the rules um, uh, for in the for the Dodd Frank Act uh, provision. It means, you know, what you blow the whistle on, there's a wrongdoing value threshold. Uh, the whistleblower needs to bring information the regulator doesn't have yet. And the whistleblower needs to provide continued assistance during investigations. Now, it's quite easy to imagine a whistleblower who suffered retaliation, so needs, needs protection, but doesn't meet any of these requirements. Wrongdoing value too low. Uh, a colleague who you didn't know about uh, went to the regulator two weeks earlier than you with the same information, stuff like that. So, and actually, if you look at the uh, eligible whistleblowers under US reward schemes, it's less than 1%, okay? Now, from a regulator's point of view, where rewards can make a regulator more efficient in enforcing the law, from that point of view, it makes sense. Right, I, I I really do this believe that there's tons of good reasons why it needs to be that few, in that logic, in that regulator's logic, but not really from a whistleblower's point of view. Um, now, uh, I, I think I'm speaking from uh, a report that uh, is sort of desk-based review report I did, commissioned by the FCA, by the way, a couple of years ago. And I think, I think you know, this will be, uh, you, you will send around the link uh, later on to that report. And in the report, we summarized, I did the report with Betania Antunes and Kate Kenny, by the way. But we summarized also different positions we had heard from whistleblowers on rewards and they they are i mean they cover the whole range of uh, some whistleblowers being really very much advocates of, of reward systems to whistleblowers saying no not at all because it's it's really bad so we've got the whole range now i'm not a whistleblower so I, I don't pretend to speak for whistleblowers but i think given the diversity of whistleblowers and whistleblowing uh, i do think it's fair to say that um, the one percent or even less, um, it's just not enough. Um, and I think, you know, we also need to consider other models that exist in other countries. Give you an example, in South Korea, there is a reward system, percentage of recovered assets. Next to that, there's also a award system where they're gonna give money to uh, whistleblowers that serve the public interest, but there's no recovered assets. There's no additional money coming in or they don't, they know no, 
how to make the calculation, but there's still an, an, an award. So that's a, there are other models uh, out there. And I think, you know, we, it's worthwhile looking at that. And I think the other point is that if it's percentage of, percentage of what, and then you can do percentage of recovered assets or percentage of imposed fine. Um, if you fine a company for 100 million, but it goes bankrupt, recovered assets would be zero. So 25% of zero is zero, but 25% of the imposed fine, 100 million is still 25 million. So I think, you know, and here's when, the regulator, you can get, you can have a technical discussion that sort of balances off profitability of a scheme versus speed, because the speed is also, I think, a big issue. Speed after how many, how much time do whistleblowers get a payout? If you have the percentage of recovered assets, right, a firm gets a fine, how they can appeal it, how long does that take? So the IRS scheme, I think on average, or at least when we looked into it, on average, it was 7.5 years before a whistleblower got a payout. That's terribly long. I know the SEC is a lot quicker uh, because they, they, they arrange, investigations don't take that long. And if you reach a settlement uh, with a firm, well, I mean, the, the firm isn't going to appeal the settlement it makes. So I think that's where you get into a technical discussion. And I think that's necessary if you do that. But I think you know the, the, the speed issue brings me to a second batch of nuances with regards to reward and, and award schemes as well. And I think they would go under the header of um, conditions apply. And, and there's loads of conditions that apply. Now, the, the, the report that, uh, and I see that, you know, it's, the, the link has come in, in, the, in the chat. In that report, uh, we give an overview of va various research uh, on which I base my claims here, but for the sake of time and, and not repeating Giancarlo, I think I can group them on the four S's, the conditions. It's speed, size, seriousness, uh, and scope. So speed of payout, that's gonna be important. If you run a reward scheme or an award scheme, payout needs to be quite quickly. You can't wait seven years. Size, size of amount is going to matter. And I think you know, Liz already mentioned you know, the CMA upping their, their, their award. We're not sure why, but size of, amount, size of payout matters. And then we've got seriousness. Um, and that's a whole question of, do you actually have a regulator who wants to fight the good fight? And I think this, this, gets, uh, this is important because the, F, the Financial Conduct Authority in the UK, I think it's a different beast than the SEC, at least in perception of how serious they are about whistleblowing. Uh, so I don't know what, I'm not making claims on the causes, on the intentions of people working there, but the perception from the outside, they're very different. Um, just two points. One, it's not like the FCA does not get whistleblower reports. They do. Um, in 2000. 22, they got, I wrote it down here, 1,048 whistleblower reports. And of that, some 800 are not fully assessed yet. So, I mean, that sends a signal that the FCA is only able to process a bit more than 22% of the reports they, they get in. I think previous years, it's, it's always 22, 25%, something like that. But actually that could, that could give, I mean, you could interpret that as a say, you know, if you're a whistle, from a whistleblower's point of view, why bother? It doesn't make a difference, okay? So what is the FCA gonna do if they go from 1,000 to 12,000 reports? You know, uh, they're, they're just setting uh, people up to fail perhaps. I think the other point, so FCA has a problem there. The other one is, FCA is keen to say, well, you know, we want to encourage uh, internal cultures, the improvement of internal whistleblowing. And I think, you know, that, that, would be, that would be great, but the FCA has a mandate to enforce whether if failing internal systems, it's just not using the mandate it has. So I, I recently found that this was a Reuters podcast and apparently the FCA in uh, 2021 had 206 reports of people saying, I raised concerns internally and got retaliated against. So uh, none of those, uh, the FCA didn't look into it. None of the firms were, were sanctioned for that. So, you know, 
again, this is a problem, you know, how serious is the FCA of actually, you know, doing something uh, on improving whistleblower conditions? So uh, I think, you know, the, the great numbers that Giancarlo talked about, um, currently it would seem to me that if the ACA is going to handle that, the numbers won't be that great. Um, and then the last one is scope. And with that, I mean scope of, of provisions. We know from research that reward schemes tend to work better in environments with less retaliation. I think the implication of that is that we need top-notch protections anyway. So rewards are not a, not a replacement of protections. So to give you an example, right, and the Dodd-Frank uh, provisions with the FCA, it can be seen as, you know, this is sort of best in class. But even the DFA had a duty speech loophole until, and which was closed in March this year. So that's to April, May, so three months ago, it was closed. Okay. So, so recently, and this is your best in class case, the duty speech loophole is something like you know, a HR person or a compliance officer, We're not talking about auditors that, that uh, uh, you, you sort of outsourced uh, something to. It's in-house HR or compliance people that in line of, of their normal reporting, they raise a concern, they get a weird reaction and on their way to the telephone or on their way to use a whistleblowing channel, even the internal formal whistleblowing channel, they get retaliated against. And so they're not protected in that case unless they go to the, to the regulator and the retaliation only happens then. So, this can also get technical, but there was a duty speech loophole, really important, and it was only closed this year. Um, and so I think, um, you know, this sort of leads to uh, the position I would take in this discussion is giving money to whistleblowers as people who fight the good fight. Yes, please. Um, but I'd let regulators go into deep technical discussions on efficiency parameters. And I think Giancarlo and I, and many, uh, many uh, of, of the people here uh, in the webinar would be happy to provide views and, and, and advice. So, you know, on that side, I'm fine. But I think my point is let's not get sidetracked uh, here. I think we need to improve protections. We need to improve adjudication of cases for the 99 percent of whistleblowers who won't get a US style reward. And so I think even the Dodd-Frank Act with very good reason seen as the jewel of US style reward schemes, it proves that improving protections and closing loopholes is a continuous point of attention and campaigning and will need a lot of people who are continue to be willing to walk that mile. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave it here for now, thanks. Oh, thank you very much. Great. Can I go back to you, Giancarlo? Because um, I had a couple of questions where you talked about um, both now and then also when we talked in the uh, in preparation for today um, about this serious information. And also you talked about issues that there was public support for it to be addressed. Um, and I wondered if you could just pull that out again a little bit more um, on from your research and how these 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 reward systems or comp even we could even call them compensation systems and for bringing information, but reward systems work. Okay, that, that's uh, I didn't have time to talk. That's my own research. I didn't mention it. It's a little delicate, but uh, okay. The point uh, in the I mean uh, that we started is that uh, uh, what makes these whistleblowers rewards acceptable. To Right. Okay. Which was a debate also went um, uh, through the, the legal scholarship in the US. So, until where can we expand our reward system that we consider? So, by the way, I totally agree with everything being said. So, I don't, there's going to be, I've never seen such an unanimous, uh, everything can be improved, it should be improved. But apart from that, so what we found is that, you know, for serious crimes, the public is the, very much in favor of rewards and they see rewards as a signal of good behavior they perceive the reward as a signal from the state that the whistleblower is doing something for minor issues and smaller rewards you get the opposite perception of the public so small rewards and uh, applied to not 
serious time, tends to be seen as uh, tipping snitches and, and this slide. Now, this is a lab experiment you know, where we were studying these things, but it reflects a little bit the fact that, you know, where uh, the US uh, stopped uh, using this uh, reward. And, uh, and you need public support. As I told you, you know, the agencies did not want more work. They didn't realize they would have a lot of resources more to face that. So they were asked, and they, uh, even recently, they didn't, there was a question to the DOJ Antitrust Division if they would uh, want to enforce, to introduce financial rewards in antitrust. And they said, the agency said no. Shocking all the academia, because in the US, uh, everybody's aware about the effectiveness. Uh, but the problem is, you know, small rewards are the worst thing you can do because you send a bad signal. You don't help somebody who loses his career. You know, you're a manager in a financial firm. You give me, or oh, in another firm, you give me 250 uh, euros, 1,000 euros. And I ruin my life. I ruin my career. What should I do with this 150 euros? So, I mean, of course, if you have a very, very effective protection system, this tops up. But we know that even the best protection system is not sufficient. Okay. So I still agree with him that uh, we, the things go together, uh, rewards and protection, you need to invest. One thing that the rewards give is a lot of resources, because all this money recovered is coming in the pocket of the state for free. And you can invest into improving protection. It's a lot of money. It's but yes, you need the support of the people. And uh, as I told you, the agency but the parliament has pushed this on the agencies. Now the agencies are happy because they, they are sitting there getting a lot of cases. Uh, and some cases, uh, Switzerland legislation has changed because of what we said before. So, uh, but yes, you need the, the support depends on the type of crime. That's why, for example, the False Claim Act was typically used in healthcare and in uh, this kind of delicate issue, you know, saving. Uh, $20 billion means uh, you know, taking care of uh, children with cancer for you know, years and years. Huh? And uh, when, you, when you mentioned healthcare, because it's obviously a very different system in the UK with a public healthcare system, you're talking about the fraud, you, you know, that the that healthcare companies are um, uh, committing against the government. Over billion by suppliers. Okay. They can do it, they do it also in the US, uh, in case. It's just that then you don't know because I have a whistleblower. Yeah. By NHS, okay. you know, they have suppliers. You don't have an anti corruption authority in the UK. You don't have a skilled anti corruption force in the UK. Number is Mr. Control. Look what happened during COVID with the contracts that are given to friends of Parliament. Members, there is no control. So you don't see it, but you know, the NHS might be wasting billions. Uh, so it's kind of fraud. Yeah, know, so it's better, yeah. Find them. Okay. Is there anything in particular that you wanted to respond to from what Wim said? No, I totally agree with him. I mean, of course, okay. you can improve. Uh, you, you know, you have to improve. You can improve. Uh, and I'm totally skeptical, like him, in in agencies uh, being the the one that uh, starts you know, pushing for this, because for them, not being aware that they could. You know, be expanded. They could have extra resources to manage this scheme. That the evidence shows that actually is not a, not a big issue than anybody expected. They don't know that they might see this as another you know additional work. And so, like the American agencies, they were against it. So it's complicated. I think it's the Parliament that's happening. Yes, it's for the citizens, for the taxpayer. It's the taxpayer issue. Yeah, I have one more question, and you may or may not be able to answer it. And it was um, just from this discussion. I have lots of other questions, and then there's questions from our audience. But um, when you talked about the numbers, right, both being small, of all ultimately being rewarded in the U.S. system, um, but also the numbers it, that you pulled out from recent reports at the FCA of how many they process of the wider, you know, maybe the greater numbers of, um, uh, you know, we don't know what the, the level of seriousness or the issues that they're raising with the FCA. 
but I was going to go back to Giancarlo and say of the, do you know how many or have a sense of how many reports do go to the SEC each year that I know it's. I have, I, have, I'm, I don't remember. I have all the numbers as I, I, I didn't mention, but I sent you a, this background notes with links yeah. to published papers and surveys. Yeah. And the papers, uh, my, my papers are not uh, particularly innovative. They do be summarized results from frontier research. But yeah. in these papers, we have all these numbers and we do also the exercise on how much uh, the number of claims increase agency by agency and uh, how much it took them to process, how was the cost of processing each claim and just to get to the stage of benefit for law enforcement. So I can't remember, but uh, there was a substantial increase. And surprisingly, okay. it was not uh, a big, uh, people were expecting a lot of, I don't know why, but they were expecting a lot of fake, uh, fake accusation, which is, you know, we're lower against, against fake accusation. Is I mean, there you can go to jail. No, I... Again, I mean, you, you go to jail if you accuse something before, so it would be yeah. a suicide. Yeah. So this never, never materialized. Great. Yes, Wim. Yeah, so sorry to interrupt that, but you know, on on the on the thing, uh, in in numbers, I, I th you know, it it just it triggers something. Mm -hmm. now, now, the really interesting metric would be how long does it take to actually assess a report, um, and it, and I we don't have that metric, which is which is interesting because you uh, you you will be aware uh, sure. and I in the whistleblowing directive. Uh, I think I have something yeah, on yeah, that. Three group. months. So mm -hmm. uh, what we see now in, in the EU, EU member states, uh, we're seeing all these uh, uh, competent authorities are being established or an existing agency is getting a specific mandate to follow this up. And so they get a three-month window. I think that's uh, that might be really tough. See, the FCA has been doing this for you know more than 10 years, and they don't manage to do it within three uh, within three months. Um, probably on average, you know, going with their st their statistics. I have no, I don't, th I'm not sure what the speed of the SEC is. Um, but yeah, I think you know the the processing thing is is a problem because uh, when I say I'm worried about the smoke and mirrors a bit, we're saying ta da, look at this, fantastic, you know, uh, uh, earlier this this month is a more than 200 million uh, award. Wow, you know. But if you're a whistleblower, you want to know if I report now, I want to know the latest next week, am I going to get that reward or not? And so that's not, it's not realistic. That's, that's never going to happen. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Perhaps we can, um, some of the questions that come through, and I think um, I, I thought a very interesting one that came through earlier was, should we be looking at, and I think it's, you've sort of talked about this, uh, Wim, and, and maybe if both of you wanted to make a, a response about looking at complete restitution of an individual and how that would be done. Um, rewards being one of them, financial compensation. It's, you know, it's about putting that person in as whole a position as they can get um, and, and making them uh, able to contribute to society again um, if they haven't been thanked uh, and their career hasn't been protected. Are we, I, I want to very much be clear on these systems because they are tools, right? They are tools that we might be missing a trick by not using, but the public debate about whistleblowing can kind of all go as if that all we're talking about is rewarding whistleblowers for everything. And what we're talking about is a tool. And so is there a, you know, what, how do we deal with the words reward, restitution, compensation, award? Um, do we, are we clear enough about that? And, and are we talking about the same things? Yeah. I mean, yeah if, you, if want, I can, you want to answer first? If I can have a first go, I think, you know, in, 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 in the, the different uh, forums where, where I, I started a conversation or, or a discussion uh, around compensation for a harm that or a detriment that a whistleblower suffered, uh, most of the time you, you mention compensation for detriment suffered. And they say, oh, no, rewards. And you say, well, no, we, this isn't about a reward I'm talking. So it, I, my experience is that the two things get, get uh, conflated, uh, confused a lot. Um, 
I, I do think, you know, uh, the sort of the, the size of the reward is sometimes seen as, well, you know, if you get 200 million, we can make the calculation on, you know, what do you think your, the detriment was, but maybe we don't need to. And I think, you know, if, if that's the size of the reward, then perhaps you, you don't need to make the, the, the calculation. But a lot of the times that's not the size of the, of the reward. And so I think, yeah, it is, it is good to make the calculation. Now on this point, for example, the, the, the protection provisions of the uh, DFA, the, the Frank Act. So even if you don't get a reward, you can use the protection provisions to seek compensation for because you've been retaliated against. I mean, there's an administrative route. If that doesn't work, you can take your employer to court uh, uh, using the protections in the in the Doc Frank Act. There's very few cases. If you if you look in the International Bar Association's report comparing all the countries uh, on adjudication of whistleblowing cases, I think they only found 29 cases in private sector where that was that 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 was done. Now, if you look at the um, the size of the compensation, so it's not a reward, but it's compensation. The calculation is is back pay, so it's just it's it's the salary you, you missed, sort of. Um, so it the the amounts aren't really big at all, and so if it's just missed salary, that's not enough for compensation. Uh, you because you could even say that the best case scenario, where someone raises a concern inside their organization, the organization takes it seriously, looks into it. Wrongdoing is found. The wrongdoer is 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 uh, is sanctioned, um, and you know the whistleblower gets thanked, and they can get off. Best case scenario, right? The whistleblower would still say, "But oh my God, those were stressful months, and I think my performance suffered because of the stress I had." So there would even be some detriment there. So I think, yeah, I uh, I think um, it, it's a totally different mode of thinking. Uh, it's it's yeah. Um, I'll leave it there. Yeah, yeah. Giancarlo, do you have a comment? Yeah, I mean, of course, uh, um, that's uh, the the word is important. You know? But I, I always, when I, I teach my students and uh, this kind of stuff, I always tell you know we know that protection is insufficient, that retaliation remains, the people you know their future career goes away. Eh? We even for the best uh, protection systems in you know, the lot front and so on. So in some sense, you can see the reward as partly compensating for all the damage that will never be able to be assessed fairly by court. Because think about how difficult it is. Uh, you know, you're a financial executive that and your CEO is embezzling money. Okay, we know that people that uh, whist blow the whistle get uh, blackmailed by the industry. So this guy will never find another job in the industry anywhere in the world. He was probably you know, earning millions a year. He starts earning zero. Or maybe you, you get uh, rehired under the Protection Act, but then they don't make you progress in your career because typically career comes with offers from other firms that never will arrive. And after three years, you know, the HR department would say, oh no, this guy is not performing. So we fire him and you know, the court would, uh, and, I mean, you know, it's very difficult to think that it would be easy to compensate wholly and whistleblowers for the amount of damage it gets once it goes to waste. So in some sense, the risk confusion is very important to keep separate the two notions and the fact that you, you need to be awarded compensation but sometimes the confusion is also because uh, it's very hard to calculate uh, what happens with whistleblowers, what, how much it, uh, this compensation is. So in some sense, these rewards, when they are paid, they tend to cover a little bit. Uh, it's a kind of a blurred, a blurred thing. Okay? I mean, I, I think, I think... the way I see it. Yeah, and just to, to say that obviously in the UK, the Public Interest Disclosure Act doesn't just is not just backwards looking. Certainly, there is the future loss of earnings on unfair dismissal. So there have been some very high um, employment tribunal claims, and one and it took a while, I think, for it to really be understood that it was never capped 
in the in the UK. So that was something that was argued when the Public Interest Disclosure Act was being discussed in Parliament. Um, that really, because if it was capped at thirty thousand, I think it was um, when it first started, that no one who had a salary over thirty thousand would ever take a claim through the employment tribunals. And so they made it from the beginning when it was being discussed in in the late nineties uh, uncapped. Um, and you have seen we have seen some very good um, uh, reward or the compensation in the, through the courts. But again. There, it does mean that we need engaged lawyers who really understand how, how to argue the cases. We need good uh, employment, employment tribunals that continue to be trained in this. And a couple of the countries in Europe, or at least one, does train lawyers so that then they've seen interim relief being, uh, this is in Serbia, where it's actually a duty to um, on, on judges to have a certificate before they can hear a whistleblower case. And one judge actually got taken off a case because he hadn't had the certificate. Uh, and because judges have gone through the training, the interim relief aspect has worked much better there, even then. And the UK has had interim relief and that was not as well uh, used for many years. And again, I'm not as up to date on the UK system. Liz could jump in. But interim relief in Serbia happens to be one of the better tools being used. So you can see what the levers are when when people really are clear on what this particular mechanism is meant to do and who should understand it and how they should apply it. Um, but again, we've got a lot of laws where it's sort of in the mix and not all the institutions that are named in the laws understand what their role should be. And the judicial system tries to fit it into their regular system. And so we still have a lot of work to do in our in our in our it, just in this this field, um, I'd like to go to another one of the questions that we got. I think it, both of you again could answer this, and then some of them I think are more probably. I would say that's not really <laughs> my space, but um, the purpose. And I think this is again what we we we're, we're talking around. Maybe I'm not being as clear. Are we trying to incentivize, you know, people to come forward? Or are we trying to address the impact of people to come forward? And I th get, think that gets again to this question of, um, yeah, compensate. Why do we use these different words? So I, I throw it to both of you. Giancarlo, do you want to start? I think you're mute. Sorry. Okay. So, okay, this is a. Uh, uh... In the US, it was introduced to deter fraud. Okay, this is called okay. the first law was enacted by Lincoln, it was called the Lincoln Law. It was introduced to stop corruption in um, during the Civil War in the supply uh, of uh, uh, weapons, uh, weapons supply and so on, of corruption. So he, you know, he was losing, was losing the wars because if you pay 10 times, you should pay for your guns, you know, you run out of money. So that was the beginning. And I think the US are very practical. I mean, very practical country, you know, when they want to get uh, a terrorist, they go there with the helicopter and then just, you know. Yeah. So they, get, they I think the US view is, we want to deter fraud. We want to stop this guy that robbed the health care system of billion every year. So the number one reason why they are happy with this is because they were. They, they, they find out, you know, they're allowed to find out many more cases and they deter crime. So this is law enforcement. The mission of law enforcement is to, you know, catch the criminals and scare future criminals. This is the general deterrence. And these things are magic because we have no other tools that has ever been that effective in the history of law enforcement. It's very hard to find other tools, even the death penalty and so on. You don't find deterrence effects. Well, here you find strong deterrence effects on the behavior of people in the family, which is uh, kind of magic. So my view is that in the US, it's mostly seen as an incentive, which is justified, maybe morally not uh, pleasant, but justified for bad crimes. Like people that steal money from you know, elderly care, so that, but not for all kinds. Okay, that's the American. That's the American. I'm not talking about myself. I'm, I mean, uh, that's, uh, I'm trying yeah, that's to great. give you the perspective that's... of what I studied, which is mostly American history and system. Yeah. No, terrific. Wim, do you have? Yeah. Well, I would say you know, if, as as far as it, it's an incentive, 
for people to come forward. That's regulators' logic. Yeah, if the, and regulators would think what is going to make me more efficient, and you know the whistleblowers coming forward might would be it. I think if we talk about rewards to address the impact, uh, I think you know it's less than one percent. I I'm not that convinced uh, uh, on that. Um, although I mean you know in in the way that I mean and. This is then going to boil down to regulators who, who, who operate a reward scheme will have a committee that then decides on you know, how big is the reward. And, and, and I think what, what you see in some of the, some of the SEC uh, uh, orders for, for reward, you see that kind of the amount that a whistleblower has suffered play some kind of role, or it's at least it's, it's mentioned. Um, but I think this boils then down to the attitude of, of the regulator. Um, but I think even with the even with the incentive, yeah, there's there's no shortage of whistleblowers. Okay, we, it's not that we don't have whistleblowers. We do, right? The FCA has more than a thousand a year. It's a bit, you know. The question is, do they do enough with it, or you know, can, could could a reward system make them do more with it? Uh, and one of the re one of the ways would be, well, uh, you could get better, not more rewards because maybe they don't need more rewards but maybe they need better quality of uh, so sorry maybe they don't need more reports but maybe they need better quality meaning people come with more evidence now i know that you know, a lot of whistleblower campaigners say like well actually you know the whistleblower shouldn't be the detective really that you know because they're going to run additional risks but okay, from a, a, a regulator's point of view, you would want people to come with you know, exactly the information that's going to allow you to do a quick investigation. Perhaps a reward scheme, a reward system can bring that about, but that would be regulator logic, not necessarily whistleblower logic. And let's just pick up on the whistleblower logic because we've had a few questions and, and there's some great questions I'm not going to be able to, and there's some that are quite involved, so I'd feel like I'd, I'd really need to get my head around them, but I think this idea of financial, the phrase reward, right, and this is again, feel free to discuss it if you feel able, but don't if you're not, um, but it suggests a financial motive. Right. So this is where the moral stuff comes in. And we don't, you know, this is not what we're here to discuss, but we could have that discussion until we're blue in the face. But can can what the question is, is can the compensation phrase kind of be scaled on a, you know, with with matrices like harm, impact on business, public interest, shareholder appreciation, and more. So we're not sort of linking right away this reward to the motive of the whistleblower which again just gets us going in crazy directions and not helpful um, for whistleblowers for the public interest for companies and for anybody to do anything effectively so is there do you think that sometimes even the word reward is actually not the right word for what the sec is doing or what the fca could do and other regulators could do Okay, my my two cents for uh, this would be, you know, Giancarlo uh, just now mentioned uh, research. Um, okay, it's it's an experimental research, so it means people got vignettes and they 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 had to say on a scale of one to seven, what what do you think? Uh, but but it's sort of suggested that you know if it's a if it's a very serious crime, a reward is seen. Yes, the person deserved that reward. The whistleblower deserved that reward. If it's a less serious uh, uh, mis, uh, mis malpractice, then people would say, well, no, maybe they're, they're profiting. So maybe, you know, um, the intuition of people would, you know, there perhaps there's some ground to say that people will, it won't help the general perception of whistleblowers to the public if there are rewards for smaller <laughs> crimes. But I think, you know, in, um, I don't think as if you're a whistleblower and you get, at the, you know, after a number of years um, and you, you've lost, you've lost your career, you've lost everything. After a number of years, they're going to say, here's 40 million. I don't think that's going to morally corrupt you. I don't think you're going to be a, a, a worse person because of that. I really don't think so. Okay, the whistleblowers, I know if they tomorrow, they would get 20 or 40 million. I don't think, you know, they, they would be uh, worse people. Uh, not that they're bad now. I don't think a reward morally corrupts someone. No, 
I, I don't. Um, and also, but I have the same thing with, with whistleblowing. Um, I think maybe, you know, we shouldn't worry so much about the word. I remember the ISO context and the international uh, context. Dog, we were going to do a whistleblowing standard, and we were sort of suggesting maybe we need to think about the word again because speak up, raise concern. And we had like the, the non English speaking uh, uh, world was actually saying, no, no, we finally got to grips with the world whistleblowing. <laughs> we're not going to change it now. It's fine. So I think, you know, rewards, award. Um, I'm not too worried about the word. Giancarlo? Um, again, uh, uh, I'm an economist. Rewards, the financial rewards, have nothing bad uh, you're using every day in the workplace to reward people that work hard and not people that work less. So rewards are fair. So I don't really understand why people think that rewarding fairly somebody who did something good with a reward as a problem, I don't. Know, maybe there is something about the English uh, that I don't understand. Or the English. Can just call it a word, a word. Compens call it as you want. But I mean, it is totally fair if somebody helped you to recover twenty-five billion of stolen money from childcare uh, to protect his career. You know, he would not find another job if he was uh, in a an accountant for the next twenty-five years with a fraction of that. And this is a law as old as we are. It was used by the Romans. It was used by the UK in the 13th century. We have a similar thing in Italy for if you find a wallet with money, you are rewarded with a fraction of that. So this is part, of, you know, has been part of the legal system for thousands and thousands of years you know, because it works. Then people are scared by the word fine. <laughs> what we want to be, you want to scare you know, a criminal organization to infiltrate our markets. And then people think about, oh, the world we should blow it. Okay. It's totally out of, uh, I don't know why people can be so superficial. Just read the numbers and change your mind. I have another question, because I think you, it was this concept of impact. And um, I think Giancarlo was saying the impact, the, the goal was deterrence. And um, and maybe having so few come through, it doesn't feel like it's it's necessarily deterring. But um, a question about you know when you have the reward systems, does it improve um, how employers and and regulators respond to whistleblowers? Does it help create better investigate? You know, does it create better investigations happening internally? So this is that I think it leads that is a kind of a question to deterrence because if if deterrence is part of what is happening, then is it because uh, the companies themselves are going, we better get this right sooner? Um, but does it also mean employers treat whistleblowers right, you know, well or better? Or are they also just then more suspicious of their staff as opposed to say, say seeing their staff as their best resource or their potentially worst nightmare? So this I think, question, you know, I think it, it was... Baroness Kramer, who recently said the regulators should flex their muscle. And I think that's the most important thing. Whether that's whether they're running a reward scheme or not, the regulator needs to be seen to enforce something. And if the regulator is seen to enforce good internal whistleblowing systems, then internal whistleblowing systems will improve. Whether there's a reward system attached to it, I think is instrumental to that. Right. If the reward system makes the regulator more efficient in finding where the internal systems go wrong and the regulator wants to do it and has a mandate to 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 do it just because you have a, a bad internal system, then I think internal systems will will improve. And I think, you know, if there is a deterrent effect or the effect that indeed internal cultures improve because of a reward system, it's also because the reward system, it's a good reward system. And it's operated by a regulator who actually uses it to enforce uh, regulation. And so I think the enforcement is, is the most important part there. Giancarlo? Yeah, I mean, uh, as I said, uh, I'm not, I, I never, when I talk about these things, I never say every country should have a reward system, okay? 
we know that in some countries uh, there is not skills to protect uh, whistleblowers are not skilled. When in India they introduced the Transparency Information Act, a lot of people died because people start to use it and uh, they were killed by you know, police. There was so not uh, not every but not all countries are able to. But those countries they have institutions that could handle decently a system like that should already you know process well their cases. And uh, as uh, we were suggesting, this is not happening. And as I told you about this note, the circulating uh, since 2014 that says that, that there is no evidence that there is an increase in the courts against all the evidence was published at the time. I suggest probably the UK is not a country where you should because there is no mandate petition. The politician don't seem to want it. The regulator don't seem to want it. And the people you know, after Brexit seem to be happy to become a Switzerland. Uh, you know, that was one. There was one thing uh, in Brexit for that to be able to deregulate and uh, attract capital city, including capital from Russia, China, and, uh, Mexico. Yeah. So you need political support and you need uh, regulators that want it. But typically, regulator, if the political support is strong, the regulator follows. Yeah. My sensation is that the regulators in the UK are not following because. Of there isn't such a push. Because uh, city is powerful. The other thing I would pick up from what Wim said, and I think it comes into the other parts of our networks that try and support whistleblowers, you know, that we all can't do all the pieces. We have to do our piece as well. You know, lawyers have to give really good advice and, and represent whistleblowers well. Um, journalists have to write really good stories. And yes, they need to understand a whistler's position and do that better, protect their sources better and understand that there's a, there's an earlier stage and there's an afterlife of reporting to a journalist, for instance. But we don't expect all these people to do it all. And what you just said, Wim, I think kind of sums it up really quickly or really, sorry, really well. And Giancarlo has been saying that with this is, these are what good systems look like that are clear, that do what they say they're going to do, follow up. And then we look at what the results are and we can improve. So the duty, <laughs> the duty loophole uh, should have been should have been closed a long time ago, but they did finally close it. So still, those programs need to learn from what they're doing. And I know when the office first started um, the SEC, there was learning about feedback, which we would have known in the advice world and in the other parts of regulation. If you don't feedback pe to people, then that is a problem. And they were seeing it as a form of protection. You know, it's actually very important to make sure people are kept in the loop. So I think. What comes out of this is if the regulators want to be serious, they will be respected for that. This reward issue can get all stymied up because people don't necessarily take it by the horns and make it work. Um, and then we leave room for these strange conversations that don't look at the evidence um, and don't look at what we're trying to achieve as clearly as maybe we ought to be doing. I want to thank you both so much. I know there were lots of other questions. Maybe we could put out some information for people. Um, Liz has come back in, but I really wanted to have this conversation. Liz and I both thought it was a perfect thing for, for at least to have an intellectually, you know, high level discussion and try and navigate this. And I, and I feel like I certainly learned something. I hope that people online felt they also learned something. And I'll pass over to Liz, but thank you both. Yeah, thank you very much. What a thought provoking afternoon and really grateful to you, Anna, as well, for sharing that so beautifully. And I'm so sorry we didn't get through all the questions. There were some brilliant questions from our audience today. You know, for me, the key takeaways were that, you know, Giancarlo's evidence from a regulator point of view, returns on investment, deterrent impact, doesn't lead to false reports. It's a no brainer, but you've got to have the political will and you've got to have proper resourcing of, invest uh, of regulators, because as Wim said, there's no shortage of people coming forward. We've got a problem with people actually enforcing the laws we already have. And from our point of view at Protect, you know, we've talked about rewards as an extra. If regulators want to go on and have a look at that because it might improve enforcement, that's really important. But it's an extra to the compensation system that we've talked about. And a lot of people have had conversations in the chat as well about is it rewards? Is it compensation? What is it we're trying to do uh, to make life better for whistleblowers? So it's really important that we continue to have uncapped damages in our tribunal system here in the UK.
for all those people who are never going to qualify for a reward or indeed who might qualify but uh, you know don't get it because they haven't brought original information or whatever the the, the, um, the rules are and finally you know all that we're doing as campaigners and advocates for whistleblowers you know none of this detracts from the really important work we do in preventing preventing whistleblowers from being harmed by creating the right cultures in workplaces. So I think that's the piece that we should really do. I'm going to ask um, Gabriel, if you're there, if you could pop up the poll one more time so that the people who have had a chance now to hear the debate would like to have another look at whether they want to uh, adopt, whether we should adopt UK, uh, US style whistleblower reward systems in the UK. Has the, have your views changed as a result of, of the webinar today, because it's been absolutely fascinating hearing from this very detailed research perspective. Um, last time, I'll just remind you, we had about 25% yes, 33% no, 42% not sure. And this time, we've got a few more people, if anybody else wants to add in, it's looking like a few more yeses actually. But also a few more no's, which is really interesting. So we've got 48%, 49% yeses, 42% no's, and 10% still not sure. And, and I think that's a really, really interesting, but not, not significant in terms of, uh, you know, we've been talking about the evidence. This is a very partial audience who are already very interested in the subject. So um, we'll take from that what we will, but we'll leave it at, uh, leave it at that. And I just want to say thank you again. Brilliant uh, discussion from some really uh, brilliant experts. Um, thank you, Anna, for chairing. And let's finish World Whistleblower Day as well by saying thank you to all the whistleblowers out there who do so much to bravely speak up and stop harm. We will send you round at the end of this um, the link to the uh, webinar and also some um, additional reading that both uh, Giancarlo and Wim have put together so that you can have a look yourselves at the research. Great. Thank you so much, everybody. And I'll say thank farewell. You. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.